Hi everybody that's in the online world. Thanks very much for joining us. We've got people in the room as well, which is really nice. Um, I know it's an incredibly busy Wednesday of many busy Wednesdays. So yeah, I'm really grateful that you guys have put some time aside. I'm doing this weird thing where I'm talking to the people in the room and to the people through the portal as well. So sorry if it's a bit strange, but that's that's how we're going to do it again this week. So without further ado, um, uh, we've got two people presenting today. Uh, one of them is Dr. Andrew Stubbs and the other one is myself. Um, and loosely speaking, well, I, I guess what I've done is try to pull some strands together um, under this umbrella that we're thinking about in terms of sort of future histories or new civic imaginaries. And, and it seemed that there was some resonance between um, Andrew's paper and, and my own, where we were thinking about auteurism and the role of the auteur or the auteur artist and um, in relation to maybe the avant-garde and um, how that might play out in terms of thinking about future strategies for um, for cultural production, really. So that may that may or may not actually be connections there. I may have made that up. We'll see by the end of the two presentations. Um, so first, I want to introduce Dr. Andrew Stubbs. Um, he's senior lecturer of film, media, and communication here at Staffs. Um, he's written articles exploring the the relationship between talent managers and auteurs in an area of era of media convergence and he's now in the process of writing a monograph on the topic for Edinburgh University Press. He's also co-managing editor of the International Journal of Creative Media Research and is on the editorial board of the Journal for Short Film Studies. So um, without further ado I'm going to hand over to Andy and there is your slideshow. Is that sharing? Not or? yet <laughs> so just do you want me to help yeah. you do that? Hopefully yeah, it's that one, that one there. Sorry, I could have done it myself. No, that's all right. Do you want presenter mode? Um, yes, I think so. Right. What are you guys seeing on the in through the portal? Yeah, I can see the presentation. Is it full screen or no? No. No, would you like it to be full yeah, screen? Yes, you can do, do that. that. I think I can do that. Thank yeah. you, Dave. Um, yes, it's, yeah, there we go. It's brilliant. OK. Um, OK, hopefully you will see in my, my slides there. Um, Hi everyone, uh, thank you uh, all for coming today to listen to my uh, presentation. Um, I'm going to be exploring how talent managers and their uh, indie auteur clients, by that I'm referring to filmmakers associated with American indie film, uh, have played a role in the cinematization uh, of television. Um, someone waiting in the lobby. <laughs> need to... <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, I think they just, they just... Have they let themselves out? I think so. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Played played role role in in cin cinematization. If you could mute your mics for me, please. I think that's feedback, isn't it? Yeah. Somewhere. Thank you. Yeah, that seems to have worked. Thank you. Um, so I'm exploring how they played a role in the cinematization of television. Um, Michael Newman and Ella Levine described cinematization as a cultural legitimation process whereby certain forms of television, especially high end, uh, big budget dramas are described as having improved in quality because it is perceived as sharing certain features associated with cinema. Um, for me, cinematization legitimation discourses, uh, which they're referring to, often stem from industry branding uh, and promotional strategies. Um, as Newman and Levine discuss, however, this legitimation process is problematic uh, because it involves reinforcing various cultural and social hierarchies, elevating, for instance, film over television, uh, and in particular, high budget niche programming uh, airing on pay television and targeted usually at middle class audiences uh, with supposedly sophisticated tastes. Uh, over traditional television targeted at mass audiences. 
Um, okay, so what I'm going to be dis uh, discussing uh, in this paper. Uh, firstly, I'm going to be outlining the emergence of a notion of quality independent film in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, second, I'm going to be exploring the industrial, economic and cultural developments uh, in TV that encourage the migration of indie auteurs to the sector. Third, I'm going to be demonstrating the ways that the indie auteur brand is exploited in TV using uh, the Nick as a case study, um, which is directed by indie auteur Steven Soderbergh. Uh, and finally, I'll be reflecting on implications for the expansion of discourses of independence to TV in the 2010s, uh, which is a really continued as well into the early 2020s. Um, OK, defining then um, American indie cinema is, is a tricky business. Um, it's quite vague, um, but throughout cinema history, definitions of independent cinema have changed uh, over time. Um, in the 1970s, for instance, independent cinema was mostly conceived of as exploitation cinema, which featured graphic violence, gore and sex of a kind that was usually omitted from Hollywood studio filmmaking. Uh, in the 1980s and early 1990s, however, independent film gained currency as a quality alternative to Hollywood. Um, at this time, Hollywood was perceived as having shifted away and abandoned effectively the more mature filmmaking associated with the Hollywood new wave, uh, such as The Graduate and uh, Dog Day Afternoon, in favour of blockbuster filmmaking targeting teens and young adults. Um, independent film began to increasingly be framed as quality filmmaking, meanwhile, due to initiatives by newly established film institutions such as the Independent Filmmaker Project and Sundance Film Festival, which aimed to support the creation of a network of independent filmmakers operating outside Hollywood. Uh, critics of publications such as the New York Times and the Village Voice also championed these films for their readers. Um, and specialty distributors like Orion and Miramax found some success marketing them to a supposedly sophisticated, well-educated audience with high levels of uh, disposable income. Um, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, several quality independent films such as Sex Lies and Videotape and The Crying Game found wider commercial success. Um, this led the Hollywood studios to increasingly enter the independent film market by acquiring and distributing films um, by independent filmmakers and producers, and by acquiring and establishing their own specialty divisions. As the studios became increasingly aware, uh, sorry, involved in the production and distribution of independent film, however, economic and industrial definitions became more and more contentious. Uh, this led to a growth in independent film being defined via a notion of the independent spirit surrounding the independent filmmaker, which focused much more on the abstract notions of sensibility and autonomy. Indeed, this definition of independent film gained particular currency in marketing and critical discourse and proved to be a highly flexible tool for promoting films with or without connections to the studios. Defined through authorship and branding, independence and independent film became a much more malleable notion one which is able to be managed and reapplied in promotional strategies to other media, including uh, TV. Um, and then this brings us to recent and parallel industrial and economic developments in TV, which have helped make TV a fertile ground for leveraging the indie auteur brand. OK, so as uh, Janet McCabe outlines, HBO has long imposed itself as a model for producing the highest quality television possible and has made exclusivity central to the channel's appeal as it is sought to, incre uh, to lure increasing numbers of subscribers. Um, HBO's success spawned waves of imitators rebranding themselves as destinations for quality TV, including basic cable channels like FX and AMC, as well as online subscription services like Netflix and Amazon Instant Video, as they also moved uh, into original programming. Now, in the 2010s, the number of scripted television series on air has apparently become so pervasive that John Langraff, the longtime CEO of FX Networks, called this the era of peak TV. Langraff stated that with approximately 400 scripted dramas and comedies on primetime television in 2015, finding the level of talent needed to create and sustain compelling original stories 
was becoming ever more challenging. Langraff also argued that intense competition between shows had made it very difficult to cut through the clutter and create real buzz, as the good shows were often getting in the way of the audience finding the great ones. Um, the author figure, especially the writer producer, has long been important to the promotional strategies that branded certain television shows as quality. However, due to increased competition in the era of peak TV, the independent filmmaker becomes particularly valuable to TV producers uh, and distributors due to their supposedly proven track record of creating innovative stories and because of their authorial reputation that can, can be used for branding and promoting high-end content. So this explains why, for instance, Netflix was willing to spend upwards of $100 million to acquire the first two seasons of uh, Fincher and Media Rights Capital's House of Cards, um, which became the flagship show uh, for launching the company's original programming and which led to a significant growth in the services uh, subscribers. Now, writing in 2013, uh, Josh Human stated that in American television, independence lacked currency in industry, popular and scholarly discussion. Since Netflix's acquisition of House of Cards in 2013, however, independence in the indie auteur has gained significant currency in marketing and critical discourse in TV. Here, I argue that the expansion and migration of discourses relating to independent film in TV is driven by an economic logic that benefits various individuals and institutions in the television and media industries. These individuals and institutions include filmmakers around which the indie auteur brand revolves, um, talent managers or agents, production companies and distributors. Um, and I'm going to discuss all of these um, now using the NIC as a case study. So the Nick, the Nick is a TV series that ran for two seasons in 2014 and 2015 on Cinemax, HBO's sister channel and part of Time Warner, uh, which I think is now called Warner Media um, through various mergers and acquisitions. Um, the Nick was written by Jack Emile and Michael Begler and was directed entirely by Steven Soderbergh, a filmmaker associated with independent uh, films through works such as Sex Lies and Videotape. Soderbergh's role as the director, uh, the single series director of the show, was and remains highly unusual for American TV, where the showrunner auteur tends to be a writer producer, uh, usually with different directors brought in to oversee one or two episodes. Significantly, The Nick was also produced by Anonymous Content, a talent management and media production company that represents Soderbergh as well as many other directors associated with independent film. A highly diversified media production and talent management company, Anonymous Content has traditionally earned most of its profits in the production and representation of talent in the commercials business. In addition, the company has produced an average of two to three feature films per year, with its productions including indie hits such as Eternal Sunshine of a Spotless Mind, Babel, and more recently, Spotlight and The Revenant. In the 2010s, however, anonymous content began to focus increasingly on the packaging and uh, production of television shows, including True Detective, The Nick and Mr. Robot, each packaged with a client associated with independent film. Discussing anonymous content's increased focus on television, Steve Gollin, its founder and CEO, cited as an influence Netflix, Netflix's acquisition of House of Cards for $100 million. House of Cards producers Media Rights Capital had successfully sold the series to Netflix by developing the project in-house, attaching a film director, David Fincher, as executive producer, and casting lead, leading Hollywood actors Kevin Spacey and Robin Wright Penn uh, in key roles. In turn, Netflix had, unusually for television production, purchased the entire series without first test screening a pilot. Thus, Gollin, Anonymous CEO stated, we saw that and said, holy shit, we can do that. We saw that they were basically using the independent feature packaging technique that we have spent a lot of time doing ourselves. Indeed, at a time when a proliferation of distribution channels, including online subscription services, were fragmenting the television audience, the television show becomes an increasingly valuable commodity. As Gollin stated, companies launching their brands 
are willing to pay a lot of money for something that they think is going to differentiate their channel. The strategy is used by producers, filmmakers and managers to sell content only work, of course, if there is a willing buyer that at least perceives that such content has a value. And of course, it is partly the role of agents or managers to overemphasize this value to drive up prices. This arguably gives content producers more leverage in the packaging and sale of content to distributors, particularly if, like anonymous content, those producers have significant influence in talent networks. Um, for producers like anonymous content, therefore, the indie auteur becomes as important in business to business dealings as it does in the marketing of content to the consumer. HBO at this uh, point in time was also under scrutiny from shareholders as uh, consumers had begun cancelling their cable subscriptions in favour of cheaper streaming alternatives uh, such as Netflix. In response to shareholders, however, um, HBO and Time Warner executives argued that competition was positive, stating that consumers were more likely to have subscriptions to both HBO and Netflix. Accordingly, the, the, the Time Warner executives presented the subscription television market to shareholders not as an area of decline, but of further growth, growth which could be achieved in part by rebranding and uh, promoting Cinemax. Now, prior to this shift into original programming in the 2010s, Cinemax was a channel known for airing movies and softcore uh, soft pornography, giving it the nickname Skinny Max. When it was announced that the nick would air on Cinemax, therefore, this drew the attention of critics who remarked that Soderbergh would bring auteur cred to the channel. Consequently, the nick helped to position Cinemax as a supplementary channel to HBO to entice cable system operators to offer both channels in their packages and to boost both channel subscriptions. HBO, for instance, would air the first episode of The Nick along with Cinemax as a way of hooking audiences and encouraging them to subscribe to the lesser known sister channel. The Nick, therefore, was part of HBO and Cinemax's attempts to capture the subscription paying audience by offering supposedly quality uh, content. And all this then brings me on to Anonymous's uh, role as a talent management company. As a talent management company, Anonymous Content works to develop and increase the marketability of its clients in order to improve their clients and their own uh, positions in negotiations. For example, upon announcing that, the, uh, that Cinemax would air the Nick, Soderbergh's manager Michael Sugar commented, what's appealing is that we're working with the same executives, marketing and financial resources. People think that Stephen's just a rebel, but he's not. He doesn't do things to be contrarian. It's the pioneer in him that persuaded him to lead us to Cinemax. And this is a quite brilliant rhetorical uh, move that portrays Soderbergh as artistic, but also reliable, autonomous, but also controllable in a way that appeals to both consumers and employers. On the most fundamental level, this strategy works to benefit the individual client by enhancing their employability increasing their fees and even allowing them to become executive producers and earn profit participation. Uh, at the same time, however, anonymous content also works to develop the marketability and employability of similar clients by, among other things, actively influencing trade and popular press discourse. And of course, again, this, this benefits anonymous content as it collects higher fees from more clients, generally 15%. Um, for instance, Anonymous as executives and managers work to position their clients and thus the company as leaders in media wide trends. Describing Soderbergh as a pioneer suggests the shift in television production and promotion in a way that enhances his individual reputation as a forerunner in an industry wide change, while also opening up a space in the television market for other indie auteur directors. Um, and now this drums up demand uh, for certain director talent in television by implying that series directed by a single director are innovative and of a higher quality. So while these comments work to improve the employability of indie auteurs, they also project notions of increased competitiveness and economic growth in television in general, but in scripted drama and comedy specifically, to increase bidding prices for their television projects. 
Cynthia Littleton in Variety, for instance, reported that in the era of peak TV, Anonymous had sparked the current mania for top tier directors treating entire TV seasons as one long movie. Notably, Anonymous content and its clients are far from being the only institutions and individuals promoting notions of increased quality around certain types of shows in the mid 2010s. Rather, these comments are part of a wider strategy uh, designed to stimulate market exchange to the benefit of specific individuals uh, and in institutions like talent agencies, management firms and their clients. And this reveals how media trends like the golden age of TV and the migration of indie talent to television can gain increasing currency and become significantly overstated. Now, finally, uh, this brings me specifically to the indie auteur, Soderbergh, as another stakeholder that benefits from leveraging the indie auteur brand in TV. Um, speaking in 2013, following what was supposed to be his feature filmmaking retirement, which was uh, inevitably short lived, Soderbergh was asked in an interview with IndieWire whether he could follow his friend of 10 years, David Fincher, into TV. Um, However, he gave two reasons for why he had been rejecting offers from executives and producers to direct pilot episodes of their shows. First, Soderbergh stated that he did not want to just direct the pilot and get his name on, his, on the show as an executive producer, but have no more to do with it. Here, Soderbergh was effectively suggesting that he sacrificed financial gain in favour of preserving his artistic integrity and autonomy. Secondly, Soderbergh claimed that he resisted work directing pilots because he didn't want to take a pilot job away from someone who made a living in TV. Again, Soderbergh's comment implies professional integrity, since he apparently refuses to steal work from a lifer, as he called them. Um, yet lifer is in fact a derogatory term akin to the director for hire um, and contrasted to the indie auteur. This rhetoric is part of a wider culture in TV, which sees certain shows promoted as quality by comparing them favorably to cinema, while also denigrating other forms of TV like the soap opera, reality TV series and traditional TV associated with the broadcast networks. Given that around the time of his supposed retirement, Soderbergh had also celebrated cinema as any screen authored work, Soderbergh is implicitly dismissing television work as inferior and contributing to unfair hierarchies across industrial and cultural categorizations. Um, and having already suggested that he refused pilot work due to its lack of authenticity, autonomy and artistry, the lifer, apparently willing and even desperate to do this work, is implied to uh, be lacking in these qualities. Uh, now, in a telling line that concluded the same interview, however, Soderbergh gestured towards his future TV work by saying that if it, if, if it was something that he had originated and came up with, then that would be different. Uh, this positions Soderbergh as a creative entrepreneur, since his TV work would apparently be an extension of his supposedly individual vision, i.e. something that wouldn't exist if he didn't exist, and because rather than taking existing jobs, he would be investing in and creating additional cultural production. This function to circumvent Soderbergh's anxieties around television, for whereas traditional television work and products appeared inferior to cinema and other mediums apparently legitimated as art, Soderbergh's television creations would seem unique and his work ostensibly distinguishable from that of the lifer or for hire director. Soderbergh subsequently went on to not only direct the Nick, but to also act as executive producer on Red Oaks for Amazon and The Girlfriend Experience for Stars, uh, an adaptation of his own uh, film, independent film. Soderbergh was particularly involved in the latter, mobilising indie auteur discourses in the development and sale by hiring Amy Simetz and Lodge Kerrigan to direct the writing, uh, to share the writing and directing credits for the entire season. Uh, on packaging the show for sale to stars, Therefore, Soderbergh commented, I said I'd like to take a sort of independent auteur director driven approach. Much like anonymous content, therefore, Soderbergh continued to advance notions of a new trend in television to pursue his creative and business uh, interests, thereby reaffirming his position as indie auteur, pioneer and creative uh, entrepreneur. Now, since Anonymous Content sold True Detective and The Nick to HBO in 2014, many more high-end series with indie auteurs attached to direct have starred, started to air on pay TV. 
Um, examples include, among many others, uh, Mark and J. Duplass directing all but one episode of Togetherness, Joe, and, Joe Swanberg, Helmin Easy, uh, Zal Batmangali directing the vast majority of the OA, jo John Mark Vallee and Andrea Arnold directing one season each of Big Little Lies, and Spike Lee helming all 19 episodes of his adaptation for She's Gotta Have It. As a result, many critics have perceived the indie auteurs' migration to television as indicative of their pursuit of creative autonomy and commitment to creating quality, innovative work. In doing so, these critics have asserted that these programmes are distinctly the work of film directors who have made television conform to them, not the other way around. Thus, they suggest that these indie auteurs have transcended television's commercial mass media limitations and traditional modes of production to have created exceptionally high quality and innovative work. Accordingly, they contribute to cinematization, legitimation discourses, reinforcing cultural and social hierarchies by elevating film over television and high end authored work catering to niche audience tastes over traditional television uh, suitable for supposedly undiscerning mass audiences. OK, and there are some references. Should you want to read about this further? Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. That was really interesting. And um, uh, I'm sure you'll have questions. Um, if you could just put them in the chat and then uh, we'll harvest them uh, afterwards. So yeah, please, please hold on to your questions and um, it's clap, clap, clap. I'm reading in the chat there, Andy. <laughs> Thank you, that's excellent. Um, okay, great. So what we're gonna do is just press on and um, then as I say, we'll, we'll please do put questions in the chat and, and we'll try and deal with them in a minute. Um, okay, I'm gonna try and find mine now. All right. Okay, have we st stopped sharing? Are we back to just a normal screen? Yeah. Gonna... Yes, brilliant. Thank you, Dave. Okay, so I'm going to hopefully share. Oh, no, I'm not. No. See if I can share my screen. And I'll just go to here. You were better at this than me, Andy. Yeah, just a little for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so hopefully you guys see that title slide. Um Dave will tell me if you can't, won't you, Dave? All good. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. OK, so um, the work of the artist I'm going to speak about today, uh, the work, his work uh, centres on skin. And for many viewers of his practice, it's precisely this fixation. Um, what Rene Matic has described as his obsession with racial violence that has occasioned tension and criticism around his motives and his artistic output. So I'm a photofilmic practitioner. I'm an educator and I was based for many years in Aotearoa, New Zealand, which is where Luke Willis Thompson was born and began his art career. My own practice and pedagogy foregrounds the ethics of lens-based visual representation and the agency of the subject. So Thompson's evolving practice um, enables me to frame some of these discussions and, and thoughts and, and um, try to figure out some responses, I suppose. So in this presentation, I'm not claiming to provide a, a definitive judgment on Thompson's work. It's more of a holistic and sort of layered perspective on it in relation to the context of post-documentary art practices and the hierarchies of the art world. So Luke Wallace Thompson first came to more mainstream international attention when his film Auto Portrait was nominated for and subsequently won the prestigious Deutsche Borsa Photography Prize early in 2018. The film's subject is Diamond Reynolds, partner of Philando Castile. As is well known, Reynolds live streamed to Facebook the immediate aftermath of Castile's fatal shooting by a police officer in their car 
while she and her young daughter were passengers. This traumatic video was logged at around 6 million plays on Facebook before it was removed by that platform. And since then, its circulation online is beyond measure, really. Thompson describes Reynolds in her video as having, and I'm quoting him quite a lot through this um, talk, as having a performative brilliance that works on a jurisprudence level. Reynolds, Thompson maintains, used her live video platform to make a legal and activist cry for help. She gave physical coordinates of the location she was in in order that she might be assisted. Friends, activists and legal representatives, representatives responded to that call and thus Thompson reasoned so could an artist. The project was a long painstaking process hinging on the building of trust and a relationship with Diamond and her lawyer. Both had been flooded with requests for media appearances, all of which asked Reynolds to relive that day and her subsequent grief. Thompson instead offered what he calls a radically open opportunity to her, for her to make the film she wanted to make. Thompson felt that the film should be silent, and this also acted as an assurance to Reynolds' lawyer that participation in the project would not jeopardise the ongoing legal proceedings. For Thompson, the next question was, how can we weaponise that silence? Um, and Thompson says, I'll just move on a slide or two. This is this is an installation view of of this work, um, which I'm going to go on to describe a little in a little bit more detail in a minute. Um, Thompson says, in the context of art, when the content is politics, mourning, or protest, I'm really interested in what silence can do. I think there's a lot of potential in the act of refusing to speak or to produce information or to translate content into data. My practice has for a while involved stripping any direct verbal communications from the work and redacting the language from the experience of art. According to the artist, the plot of the film is the becoming real of that figure previously only known in the Facebook clip. Her silent singing and speaking within Auto Portrait is an opportunity for Reynolds, he claims, to have a suspended moment of freedom and also to create a moment of potential interpolation of meaning for the audience. Reynolds withheld voice, however, and you can see her, she's humming to herself at times. She's sort of singing and talking to herself, but there's no sound. Um, this withholding, however, is an ethically complicated and mediated act of reclamation. Auto portraits a 35 millimeter analog film shot on Kodak double X and imperceptibly slowed down. This mimics the, con the conditions of Andy Warhol's screen tests. Shot in two takes, each, um, four and a half minutes long over a period of five days in Minnesota. Auto portrait in Thompson's words is an attempt to make Reynolds real again for those who sit in the gallery space with the celluloid for those nine minutes of screening. Thompson speaks of the film as a sister piece that adds back the missing ethical balance, <coughs> excuse me, to the viewing of Reynolds viral Facebook video that the work allows for the possibility of a witnessing that does not reinscribe the, per the perpetrated trauma back onto black lives. However, auto portrait continues to be a polarizing work for the possibility of, a, um, as further evidenced in critical views and by the protests following its nomination for the esteemed Turner Prize in the UK later in the same year. Online critique and staged on-site protests by black activists and artists have centered on Willis Thompson as a non-black or white passing male artist of privilege. The assertion being that Thompson profits from black pain in both monetary gain and in a claim for his oeuvre. Um, this was a silent sit-in at Tate Britain around the, um, the announcement of the finalists for the Turner Prize. The project of decolonization in the, in the Pacific is ongoing and complex. However, there's an increasing understanding that the claiming of genealogy or whakapapa is not um, reduced to percentages of DNA, but in broader cultural terms of lineage. And this can be a tool with which to reconnect with a pre-colonized cultural background. It's from this position, one of an Afro-Oceanic solidarity that Thompson claims to operate. Paul Andrew Wood, art commentator in Aotearoa, New Zealand, speaks convincingly to the issue of a white passing person of colour from the perspective of the Pacific in the following quote. 
putting aside the quite natural variations in complexion among Polynesian and Melanesian peoples, Thompson's indigeneity is inalienable from his genealogy, or whakapapa, and his being raised as Aitauke, Fijian. It has been very popular with neo-colonialists seeking to alienate indigenous people from their identity and more disconcertingly turns up in internal Maori and Pacifica politics. He says that sort of internalized racism is a product of colonized thinking planted by colonizers to undermine the resistance of the colonized. Thompson himself, when questioned about his right to make this work, has said indigeneity or blackness has been a question that's been hovering around the work. Who are you to make it? I didn't think of myself as an indigenous person in my life before university. However, my response has been subsequently, yes, of course I am not just not from the African diaspora. On the one hand, I claim it racial identification. On the other hand, it can't be ignored. It's not my intention to rescue Thompson or the work from these critiques but a closer scrutiny of his references and influences may help to illuminate what's at stake in this complex debate. Andy Warhol looms large in any discussion of identity politics, imagery production and consumption, particularly within an American context. And his work is a, this is Thompson's work, is a clear and acknowledged influence. No, it's not, it's Warhol's work, is a clear and acknowledged influence on autoportrait. Some have seen Thompson's appropriation of Warhol's original screen test format as a positive act of rebalancing of that whitewashed original set of films. From Warhol's 472 screen test subjects, only around four were people of colour. However, Thompson himself disavows any easy comparison between Warhol's screen tests and autoportrait, either positive or negative. Instead, he states that it would be an absurd assumption to imagine that Warhol was not aware of his own image production as a component of a lineage that runs parallel to the problematic history of photography itself through criminal and racial physiognomy, police wanted posters, archives and the mugshot. Thompson asserts that photographic history condenses. In every picture lies almost every other picture. Thus the mugshot or screen test does apply this type of apparatus of black image production onto predominantly white subjects and that's where some of the drama occurs. This positioning of Warhol as someone both operating within and subverting the apparatuses of taxonomy and surveillance offers a nuanced reading of his work and one that aligns with a rethinking of Warhol as an artist whose strategies were not in fact ironic, but instead inclusive, an artist who celebrated both similarity and singularity. Nonetheless, the use of such a Warholian ready-made sets up associations for an audience that only a close reading of Thompson's contextual discussions contradicts. Thompson himself has allowed that these associations are problematic. Indeed, he infers that with autoportrait, he's beginning to move away from this model or referent, claiming that the Warhol trademarks of multiplicity, implied seriality and contemporaneity are exhausted as artistic strategies. He says of this that he himself is desperate to step outside of that flow of image production, which he sees as, as an inherent aspect of this new genre of internet videos of police violence and racial trauma. His use of 35 millimeter film, an anachronistic material that cannot be viewed without consent within an exhibition context and has no digital equivalent um, through his instruction, along with the extended production period for what is ostensibly a simple piece of filmmaking, are direct counterpoints to this online flow. Tavia Nyong'o describes these material qualities as creating a counter viral image, one that can only exist in the indexical present. While this may be true, the use of 35 mil film, the ponderous production apparatus that you can see in this image and the Hollywood lighting in the film itself all operate to create something of a didactic binary. The poor JPEG, the trashy online videos that require the skill of the auteur to resuscitate Reynolds tarnished digital image. This purported ability of the film, Autoportrait, to rehabilitate Reynolds in the public realm is a reading that has been championed by some reviewers. Peter Shand, who's the head of Elam Art School in Auckland, which is Auckland, well, it's New Zealand's um, top art school, where Thompson was an undergraduate, states that the film, through its materiality and experiential uniqueness, 
ennoble Reynolds and afford her a different type of dignity than that she assumed the year prior. Other writers describe the erratic quality of the 35 millimeter film utilized by Thompson as granting Reynolds a direct and almost physical presence. These inadvertently patronizing terms may not fairly describe the intentions of the artist, but they do alert us to ways in which the work may be failing its subject. Erica Balsam, in her review of the Turner finalists for Freeze, calls Thompson's artistic strategy facile. She didn't hold back, it was quite withering. Uh, noting both the dispossession occasioned by the loss of sound and the use of what she decries as mimicry of the Warholian screen test format. She rejects the idea that Reynolds requires any such rescuing, critiquing the screen test as no template for filmic empathy and labeling Warhol, Warhol along with everything as a commodity fetishist. It's worth noting that Thompson has historically been quite opaque about his practice and intentions throughout his career. Supplementary contextual information about individual works and exhibitions is often withheld in the gallery, while often this backstory is essential in the attempt of a greater understanding of his work. This type of work relies in no small part for its effect on an insider knowledge of art history. Thompson's acutely aware of and responsive to the narratives and methodologies of other conceptual artists in the canon. He admires Warhol, as we've seen, as well as Duchamp, and seeks to place his own work in direct dialogue with these artists, amongst others. An impulse to inscribe himself into this canon seems to be at play at times, and earlier works operate very directly in relation to seminal artworks by Duchamp, a conchie here, as well as Warhol. This is... Um, this is a sort of homage or appropriation of a Conchie's um, following piece um, that Willis Thompson um, enacted in New York. A possibly unintended outcome of this conceptual sampling is the creation of a contextual framework that is imbued with the rarefied aesthetic and tone of the art academy, a reading that would reinforce the critique of privilege and elitism levelled at Thompson, and one that might be borne out in part by his trajectory through top art schools in New Zealand and Germany. Thompson also relies heavily on eminent art institutions to support his work. This is not, however, a straightforward relationship. While Thompson utilises connections and access that galleries and curators can provide, his work's often very demanding of those very people and spaces. So this series of Aconchi inspired street performances in New York, for example, played out away from the security of the white cube and um, sort of patrons of the gallery were, would follow young um, queer black men into, into, into their own neighborhoods uh, to sites where some private sort of narrative was playing out, which I imagine created some unease. We might also question Thompson's insertion of autobiography into works that purport to be at the service of the subject. Although Thompson prevaricates a little about the title, he does acknowledge that the use of the term auto-portrait is a strategic attempt to insert himself into the film. He states that, I asked myself, what would it mean to interpolate myself into her life and vice versa? In the actual filmmaking, it becomes somewhat a portrait of me as much as of her. All of my decision makings are designations that circulate around who I am. Statements like this from Thompson seem to me to echo some of Warhol's obsessive desire to attach himself to the aura of his subjects through his lens. I'm not suggesting that there's a moral imperative for an artist to avoid the autoethnographic, but in Thompson's case, the attachment of his own persona to that of Reynolds has fueled claims of exploitation of her story. One does have to wonder why, if the work is the result of the careful collaboration claimed, Reynolds is not named as co-author. Autoportrait should be considered one work in a loose trilogy. The first, Cemeteries of Uniforms and Liveries, uh, made in 2016, was shot in 16 millimeter film, also slowed down for projection and silent, the content being durational filmic portraits that offer up to our gaze two young men directly impacted by racially motivated police violence in the UK. The title, again, references Duchamp, and formerly the work is the most direct descendant of the Warholian model previously mentioned. However, subsequent works by Thompson appear to be in some sense an artistic response to the issues raised in this presentation. And I don't have time to go, out, go into them in detail and it's kind of, his work obviously is still happening. So um, 
this is the, this is a very once over lightly look at his more recent work. Um, Thompson's 2018 film work Human is an overt homage to black British artist Donald Rodney. The film presents a forensic macro investigation of Rodney's original architectural sculpture. Rodney suffered from a hereditary genetic disease present largely in black bodies. And the small sculpture of a house, which is what this is a macro image of, um, was constructed from his own skin fragments. Thompson again twins himself with the protagonist of his film, editing the film mathematically in reference to his own genetic sequencing. He and his siblings are carrying a similar hereditary disease, this one predominantly found in the bodies of Europeans, another form of autoportrait, perhaps. This work was shown in the Gallery of Modern and Contemporary Art in Italy alongside uh, this work, Black Leadership, a floating projection consisting of the text from a rebuttal that Thompson wrote to an unnamed art journal editor protesting their editorial take on autoportrait. The tone of voice of this text is anguished and suggests that the critique around the Turner Prize nomination has caused the artist considerable psychic pain. Um, I don't know if you can read that, but yeah. Uh, he, yes. Well, um, these slides will be available. You can, re you can read it in full. I won't do him the disservice of trying to read that, but um, it's, it's an interesting uh, rebuttal. Most recently, in conjunction with his Berlin dealer gallery, Thompson has installed a giant billboard opposite the headquarters of the Nobel Institute, um, which is visual support on an epic scale for the 2021 nomination of Black Lives Matter for the Nobel Peace Prize. The photograph images a young black man, semi-clothed, lying in a flowery field. Uh, according to the press release with the show, the photograph is actually composed from nine exposures within a sole eight by ten photographic negative to record the mechanics of breathing within a single image. Um, and I don't know if you can tell from that slide, but basically what, what's happening is that the diaphragm and the rib cage are sort of slightly blurred and um, apparently it's, it shows shifts in the throat and um, uh, locks a period of time into a single frame there. There are clear references both within the structure of the image and the title of the work to the words spoken by Eric Garner and George Floyd and then taken up by the Black Lives Move Matter movement. And this work appears to be the most straightforward expression yet of Thompson's allyship with calls for social justice for all black lives. However, I still suggest that in this work, the black body remains central and visible, pinned by the mechanics of lens based reproduction to the screen. So it seems possible to track a shifting position in relation to content and context, the artist rethinking in each project his own relationship to these complex issues of representation. Thompson says this about his intentions for his art. That is the historical power in an artwork. It's not what the rest of the world is doing. That is the task to come out with a thing that doesn't exist and then share it. Ultimately, then, autoportrait may reveal more of Luke Willis Thompson's ambitions for his art than they achieve on behalf of its subject and serves to reinforce the hierarchical positioning of the auteur artist at the vanguard of contemporary art. However, it also operates, as he has stated, in the same way as a Rorschach test, a framework within which we are each called upon to negotiate and delineate our own ethical limits. The challenges inherent in viewing Thompson's developing practice always bring us back to the ever problematic relationship between photography and representation. For artists, subject and audience alike, these works operate in that most complicated and sensitive zone, the threshold where the skin meets the world. Thank you. That's the end of that. Thank you. OK, um, stop sharing. Right. Um, brilliant. I can see a question in there. That's fantastic. So if you want to put a couple more questions in the chat or just hang fire, I'm just going to close the camera for a minute, move the laptop to where Andy and I are sitting uh, in our very much not indie or tourist <laughs> broadcast production, and then we will come back to you. So hang on a moment.
Okay, we're back. Oh, do you want to mute? Are you on mute? Mutey mute. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, oh, is that gone? That echo. Thank you. We've got a rogue in the room. No, you're not. You is are. It's not our own speaker. No, it's not around the table. No, I don't think so. No. That's gone now. Oh, it's gone. Brilliant. OK, yeah. sorry about that. All right. Um, so thank you for putting questions in the chat. And we've got a question in the room. I just thought I'd just briefly turn to you, Andy, and see because um, a couple of things came up when I was listening to your talk and I just wanted to give you a chance to maybe yeah. expand on them a bit. So the things I was wondering about really were what what you feel the position of this kind of indie auteur is in the middle. Are they being manipulated or are they benefiting from this kind of mythologizing or is it do they know they're being? Yeah, I think that they um, are, are party to party to to it um they they are working they hire their client uh, their agents or managers um and they will discuss the strategies that they're going to use um to promote themselves and their work build their careers as well um yeah i wouldn't see them as being manipulated no no absolutely not i think that um i think that they're definitely party so then that's the quite some of some of those quotes from Soderbergh are quite disingenuous then. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. I think that um, there are enormous amounts of, of quotes uh, from 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 the filmmakers themselves where they're I, I would call it rhetorical maneuvering, mm. um, you know, where they're portraying one thing and it's like a soft sell um, where they can't seem too commercial. Um, but you know, there's always a kind of commercial motive under underpinning it mm. as well. Um, and of course, that's the basis of their appeal that they come across as authentic artists, kind of rejecting to a large extent the the kind of the commercial mass mainstream, working for the corporations, seem to be mavericks to some extent. Because you know, they don't work. Maverick doesn't work for uh, uh, you know a Time Warner or a Disney. Mm. Um, I mean, there's a there's a quote more recently than the, the case study that I've looked at today um, from Soderbergh, where he struck a, a huge multi-million uh, dollar deal with um, Time Warner. And he's working now basically exclusively for um, HBO Max. Um, and, he's, and he gives his reasons for, you know, uh, signing this contract with them. And he, and he says, you know, I'm part of the Time Warner family now and they've, uh, they share my ethos and they have the same commitment to quality. And then he said, and of course, there's, a, there's also an economic um, uh, benefit I and mean, that's quite nice too and he's, he's kind of tongue-in-cheek at the end but he, you know he obviously knows that he's mobilizing this his own brand to to, to bring something extra to the party yeah, yeah. Uh, it's interesting because I was thinking <clears throat> about that in relation to that slide I showed of um, Willis Thompson's kind of rebuttal <clears throat> to the to the art journal writer in which he says you know think about it from my perspective basically you know I'm <laughs> How can I make the sort of art I want to make without um, without being sort of somehow implicated in this idea of of um, exploitation or commercialization? Um, I guess yeah, he's he was trying to play the card of um, the artist's got to eat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, your, your, that quote, remind, and you were speaking a bit about blackness as well mm. and things like that. And and I've more recently been studying a um, a black talent agent who was the first talent agent at a major agency and who's working with black directors. So it's quite unusual, and he's advocating for figures who are underrepresented in the industry. And you know, he's been in, being interviewed a lot by, you know, organisations like Bloomberg um, and. Um, like financial institutions and the, the the Wall Street Journal and things like that, who inevitably frame their work in particular ways. So, you know, it is very difficult for them to kind of opt out of the system mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, if, you know, if they're going to, you know, uh, work in a certain environment, they yeah. inevitably, uh, you know, participate in that yeah. art world that I think you're talking about. Yeah, there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, thank you. So I'm go oh, good. OK, so we've got a couple of questions here. We've got one in the room and um, I will go to, uh, I think this is David's question. I'm curious how the indie auteur discourse surrounding Soderbergh intersected with his involvement in last year's Academy Awards broadcast. 
That's a good question. It is a good question, yeah. Um, and it's something that I have thought about as well. And Soderberg is very um, involved with the the union, um, the, like the producers union, the directors union in, in Hollywood. And, and he directed, I believe his kind of motivation really for doing the Academy Awards was a part of um, a, an effort by Soderbergh to help get people back to work as well, following and get the industry going again, following like the COVID kind of shut down. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think Soderbergh, compared to maybe some uh, figures, you know, Soderbergh has relatively good politics, I think, in that regard. Um, and, you know, I think that there's an aspect of what he's saying there um, in that quote, you know, I don't want to take jobs from others, where he is being, he is trying to be, um, you know, uh, supportive of others, um, but yet where it's still got that negative connotation underpinning it, mm. where he's still promoting himself ultimately as well. Um, and that's that's where there's a problem here, mm. um, because he is promoting himself at the mm. same time. Yeah, um, they're, 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 <laughs> I mean, it's a first world problem, but they're sort of caught, <laughs> aren't they, within the structure in a yeah, way. Yeah. yeah, and it's complex, I think. You know, I, I would say I wouldn't want to align him too much. You know, he's not entirely this kind of commercial entirely like business seeking person um and he, he does have creative impulses as well and you know it's, com it's complex more complex than um you know the, the press discourse and mm. things like that that can can possibly account for mm. or do account for mm. great okay so we have another question here which was does thompson acknowledge or discuss the history representing black bodies by way of ethnographic photographic practices and his work's relationship with that history and that's a really good question as well and i've not heard him directly address ethnography uh in relation to his photography um i think he does uh in the, uh, he he rarely gives interviews and he rarely uh, there's very little um there's very little uh, of a way to get into his insight, you know, get insight into his his processes. He's he's really guarded, um, so that's <laughs> so it's tricky to know what he looks at and what he takes in that. But that one quote where he speaks about um, the way that the history of photography condenses and sort of folds in on itself, and so every portrait uh, retains an aspect, or every every representational photograph retains an aspect of every other. So he would, I think, he would argue that. Um, there are elements of those ethnographic kind of categorizing photographs in his in his portraits, but that they are subversions that they that that he is somehow subverting that practice. And I think that's I, I just think that's really complex. And I'm not I think even though that's his intention, I'm not sure it's working. And I think he's sort of weighted down by he's almost in a way, I think, been handicapped by going through a really high end fine art education um, that has layered on top of his own lived experience um, a set of hierarchies and conceptual premises that, that are kind of clouding his intentions now for his work. And yes, I agree, some of that work looks very ethnographic and I think that's problematic. And I think also, you know, that the, the billboard image, which I only have only seen recently and uh, so I'm still kind of processing what I think about it, but I, I think there's lots of problematics in there as well about the, you know, um, the passivity of of the body position and the gaze and yeah, um, yes. So um, he would probably acknowledge it, but he would think he was unraveling it at the same time, perhaps speaking for him. <laughs> the lack of clothing. Yeah. Why? Uh, well, yeah, I can I can speculate. Um, I suppose to see the rib cage move up and down, but surely you could do that. I, yes, there's yes, I, there's other ways you could do that photographically, or perhaps it's moving. Perhaps it needed to be moving image in this instance and not a still. So, um, yes, I'm going to thank you for that good question, Mr. Barks in the room. Well, it might be slightly off being friendly. I was just, I was interested as you were talking to think about the audience. I wonder if the audience in some way has encouraged um, indie authors to move to those platforms because of the way, different ways, ways that people can watch um, TV. Mm. Um, you know, binge watching or things like that. 
Yeah. Shall I? Shall I just meet? I'll just. Did you guys hear that? So Rick was just asking how what bigger part how big a part the audience plays also in in um, the popularity of of this um, cinematization uh, via different platforms of being able to watch streaming, you know, on your phone, etc. That's what you meant, wasn't it, Rick? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. I think that. Um, a lot of the idea here when we're talking about the single series director that is often uh, linked explicitly to uh, things like streaming and the ability to watch all at once. Mm -hmm. um, the, the condensing down of, I suppose, uh, a single a television production into kind of one unit or giving the impression of that, like removing of uh, commercial breaks and the weekly schedule. And so there's the, there's very much um, a notion tied to this promotion, this form of promotion and marketing um, that is, you know, pitching it as innovative, revolutionary, no longer TV. And that's where we talk about the cinematization. Um, I mean, I think that that again is tied then to, you know, the dif distribution infrastructure that's now, uh, you know, emerged. Um, and then, but then also, you know, uh, marketing discourse and marketing speaking and of itself. Mo Netflix has been obviously. Um, touts you know binge watching as a as a form of watching um and david fincher if we talk about um house of cards he himself repeatedly said you know i watched house of cards and binged it you know it, you have to watch it how the audience is going to watch it and really what he's doing there is he's encouraging a mode of watching um so yeah i would see it uh, i suppose as being industry and marketing driven and then you know the audience but i, I mean i suppose at the same time you know um DVDs, uh, Netflix, was, which was a, a mail subscription service before it was a streaming service, um, you know, DVD was a big place where people began binge watching before they did it in streaming form. Um, so, yeah, I think that they're adapting to and then also shaping um, the, 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 the kind of forms of consumption, yeah. I just, um, just one other thing that I was really interested in um, was the way, you know, you're framing this up uh in relation to the kind of reinforcing of social hierarchies mm -hmm. and so um this idea that the kind of pay tv the streaming cable etc that that's predominantly being consumed by middle class audiences who are more drawn to uh more complex or more mm -hmm. crafted or more cinematic experiences so that and then uh, what's on the other side of that of that coin is that, so is that is there a value judgment thing that's happening there it, for you or can you just talk about that a bit more yeah i absolutely i mean uh, to use a phrase i think it's um, pierre bourdieu who says um you know taste classifies the classifier um and it, you know net, um hbo's slogan is it's it's not tv it's hbo and you know they've aligned themselves very much with um cinema as as we're kind of talking about here and i think what they're doing is they're offering their consumers and i kind of an identity as well you know um to be watching something different um so you know um they are appealing to people who you know have the disposable capital and in in, in kind of return they're offering that um sense of sophistication and um exclusivity back back to them um you know, and, and that's how I suppose branding to a large degree, if we think about clothing labels, you know, branding kind of says, I can afford this, I, I've got the taste to to, to have this. Um, and then there's obviously a problematic aspect to that, which is, you know, there's a denigration of traditional television. Um, I mean, in particular, and there's a gender issue as well here, um, you know, what we don't see ever uh, spoken about in terms of cinematization and legitimation is soap operas, mm -hmm. um, but soap operas are very, very similar to these high-end TV series that we're talking about here, where they're long-running, they're character-centered, um, but soap operas are never spoken about in these terms and actually are often contrasted to these high-end dramas as being the opposite, um, despite being very similar. Of course, soap operas are associated with traditional television, women, people who stay at home during the daytime, um, people that don't have, you know, the same levels of disposable income because they're not often on the pay TV channels. Um, so Lower there's a production values as well, right? Yeah, fast yeah, exactly. turnaround kind of things yeah. like fast food TV. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, you know, these these shows uh, that we're talking about here, they they throw, in one sense, they're throwing the money at the screen and saying like, this is worth paying for because it is such 
high value, you know, um, things like um, Bulwark Empire or the NIC, you know, these are made on big budgets. Um, and then, then, you know, they they use that as a, a, a to show that this is event programming, as I say, worth paying for. Mm. Yeah. And then does that build an overall brand loyalty to that platform that then spills over into their, their other content? Is that is that the idea? I think, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I mean, something like uh, Mr. Robot, which was on um, USA Networks, uh, they they acquired uh, Mr. Robot as a way of kind of revamping the channel. Um, and, you know, Mr. Uh, USA Networks weren't only airing, th like HBO, you know, do, does very much trafficking, you know, big budget, high end. So it's kind of exclusively that. But USA Networks also had things like wrestling or, or, or um, I think American football or American hockey or something like this, but they definitely had the wrestling on, you know, so um, definitely they kind of use these these main flagship programming to to build their brand identity. And then they kind of um, rebranded themselves as being about the brave and edgy programming, you know, innovative. Yeah. So I think, yeah, definitely spilling over to other things. Excellent. Great. OK, um, I think. We can wind it up there. Oh, hang on. Just thinking of this is from Lynn. Just thinking about the example of Cheryl Dween. If I've mispronounced that, I apologize. First black lesbian to direct a feature film, watermelon woman, an indie filmmaker. However, would you categorize as auteur? She's now worked on Lovecraft Country. Yeah, I think this is an interesting question. Um, <laughs> a lots of, and lots of, um black uh female as well black and female directors lesbian filmmakers um who have made kind of one um independent film maybe once uh then didn't get offered the same level of um she didn't work for a long time yeah didn't work for a long yeah. time and there's lots and lots of examples uh like this women then who went on to direct television a series susan seidelman and um, there's lots and they're not coming to my mind at the moment mm. but um, they went in often to television uh, where they would were, would receive work, um, but usually directing one or two episodes. So they don't have this same kind of brand, uh, auteur brand that, that, you know, the Soderberghs and, the um, you know, the Nicholas Wyndham Reffins and whoever else have have. Um, and, you know, in, in effect, that that um, kind of career path that they have charted, I think, is the op is is kind of stands in opposition and you know a sign really of the inequalities in the industry. Mm. I mean, I think that the the the, the term auteur is is a kind of discursive construct. So, um, you know, they don't. I would say that they maybe don't have the same level of brand identity. Mm. Certainly, yeah. Mm. Um, but I mean, uh, as well, there are some kind of um, exceptions to this rule. Um, Ava DuVernay has made is executive producing. She's a black female director as um, executive producer in a series for uh, Oprah Winfrey's own network. And what she has done is she has used that as a way of hiring um, women um, directors exclusively and uh, many women of colour nice. and then serve and then use that as a kind of uh, platform to help those women get get work. Um, and then, of course, there are um, some uh, black predominantly male directors who have um, uh, participated in this strategy as well. Um, Barry Jenkins, who did Moonlight, did the Underground Railroad last year for Amazon. And um, Spike Lee's obviously done. Um, she's got to have it as adaptation of that for television. Steve McQueen, I guess it's yeah, not quite yeah. the same paradigm. But sim but, similar, yeah, yeah, yeah similar. Um, so, you know, uh, but yeah, predominantly, I think what we see, we see is um, white male authors, which is typical of um, American film history, really. Um, mm. You know, that, that's that's who it tend, this brand identity tends to be built around. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> and a great film to show the students. So yes, <laughs> that down. I'll take a look. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Brilliant. Look, um, thanks very much uh, to everybody. Thanks for your questions. I've really enjoyed speaking to you, Andy, and Thank you. thanks to you guys. The, you can't see how full this room is. <laughs> just, you know, just imagine a sea of faces. Um, so uh, thanks very much. 
um, I'll be the, the schedule's full now for the rest of the semester. So that's brilliant. So I know everyone's super busy on Wednesdays, but I will be sending out the whole schedule for the rest of the semester. Um, and hopefully um, those of you that can attend will. And this is sort of the format that we'll be following for the rest of the time. So again, much appreciated for you to put the time aside and um, see you at the squeeze box. Thank you. OK, cheers.